Thank you very much, Paul, for the kind introduction, and I thank the organizers for this splendid meeting. I've had a wonderful morning uh, listening to the other speakers. So I will now change the subject and talk about what I consider to be the theme of these um, various changes that have been described. And I use the words of Hippocrates in the fourth century BC. Whoever wishes to pursue the science of medicine must first investigate the seasons of the year and what occurs in them. And I will fo focus really on water quality and child survival. There's a direct correlation for countries like Cambodia where less than 20% of the population have access to safe drinking water. There's a death rate of children under the age of five of something in the order of 200 per thousand. Uh, similarly for Ethiopia, Zambia, the Sudan, etc. And the total diarrheal diseases, water distributed, water ca caused uh, in life years, you can see that it is the um, less developed countries that suffer the burden of this lack of access to safe water. I'll focus predominantly on cholera, uh, which um, has been with us for um, since the times of the writings of the Sanskrit, where you can deduce cholera epidemics had occurred. A bacterium that we grow on media in the laboratory, shown in the upper right, uh, yellow colonies, and the bacterium on the lower right. And then from the New York Times, um, about 1850 or 60, where um, the warrior asleep on the pier to the harbor of New York, the belt says science, asleep while the specter of cholera arises. And we still, in the 21st century, are fighting the problems of cholera. And I point out one very tragic example um, Zimbabwe, in the year 2007, uh, well, uh, officially reported in 2007, 2009, something like 85, 65 cases and uh, about four deaths. But by um, the late, uh, just starting in 2008 and to the present, because of corruption, because of um, the lack of funding, going to purchase of chlorine, uh, a country that had a um, paradigm, really, for Africa in providing safe drinking water, resulted in, to the present, over 100,000 cases, close to 120,000 cases, and about 10,000 deaths, quite needless because of the fact that it was preventable. So Vibrio cholerae uh, is the subject of the talk because it is so linked to the environment. And as Paul pointed out, we were able to show that one of the reasons it was so difficult to identify the organism, detect it, between epidemics is because it essentially goes into a dormant stage shown there six months uh, in a suspension of saline at a low temperature. So the organism has the capacity to go dormant in the environment and detectable by techniques that we use um, molecular genetic adaptations, in this case, using a, um, a monoclonal antibody linked to a sodium isothiocyanate um, molecule that is visible under uh, UV light, and more recently using gene probes to detect the organism. Studies that we did going back to the 60s, shown here from the 70s to the present, uh, in the Chesapeake Bay led us to the conclusion that the bacterium is very much related to temperature. That is, you can detect the bacterium in the spring months when the water temperature and the salinity is optimum. That led us to conclude the bacterium is in the environment, um, which at the time we presented the data um, was not really, I should say, modestly was not accepted. In fact, we further went on to show that the bacterium is very much associated as part of the natural flora of plankton. In this case, a gravid um, zooplankton a copepod with its egg case covered um, with the bacterium. A single copepod can carry as many as 10,000 to 100,000 cells, and an infective dose is a million cells. So if you increase the population in a water supply, you increase the infective dose. 
There are many potential reservoirs we now know. Um, this is a review article by Carlo Pruzzo, a colleague in Italy, who has accumulated all of the public pa published papers and have shown that there are many different um, organisms in the environment that will carry the bacterium, but it is really the plankton population that leads to the increase in numbers spring and fall as the plankton themselves bloom. Cholera is global in distribution. Uh, the epidemics uh, in Africa continue. And the epidemics in Latin America, starting in 91, 92, when there hadn't been major epidemics for 50 years, were very severe with a couple hundred thousand cases and thousands of deaths. Now, we generally assume that it is the part of the world as the home of cholera, and that is in Asia and in the countries of India and Bangladesh. Bangladesh, particularly the Bay of Bengal, uh, is supposed to be considered the home of cholera, but really, let's say it's the residual home, because in Europe and in the United States, 100 years ago, we did have epidemics. Much of the work that I've done and uh, am reporting uh, is uh, in the southwest part, 50 kilometers from Dhaka, in an area known as MATLAB, uh, first the Southeast Asia uh, laboratory and now internationalized. And these bodies of water uh, are carved out uh, and the houses are built in the earth that's excavated. And the red dots are the hot spots of cholera in that particular location. And the H denotes the hospital where we do much of our work. Because cholera is in the news uh, with the um, epidemic in Haiti, and I'll discuss that at the end of my talk, I just want to make sure that you understand that it is a devastating disease. It can strike within 24 hours, um, particularly during heavy rains, the post-monsoon period. The cholera victim shown in the uh, upper right uh, is in a cholera cot, which is still used even today as a crude measurement of the fluid loss through vomiting and diarrhea. The original work that um, I carried out back in the 60s was essentially in a hospital that consisted of a, a concrete slab and canvas walls that were rolled down during the monsoon season. A cholera victim close to death properly rehydrated either through intravenous rehydration or oral rehydration more recently will recover within 48 hours and be an active um, healthy individual once again recovering from that episode. This is the amount of fluid that's required to replenish a single cholera, adult cholera victim. You can lose up to 18 liters in a given day. So it's a severe dehydration that leads to systemic shock and their death. Now, we developed a model for the epidemiology of cholera based on all the work that we had done in the Chesapeake Bay, in Bangladesh, in India, uh, whereby essentially the um, warming of the ocean in the, and water bodies in the spring months with um, increased sunlight. The temperature increase um, leads to the phytoplankton blooms, which in turn are grazed upon by the zooplankton. And the increased populations of the zooplankton, which have a chitin exoskeleton, and the vibrios, including vibrio cholerae, have a very powerful chitinase. So they have this evolved relationship with the zooplankton. With the ground truth data, that is not satellite, but simply the measurements of temperature, salinity, inorganic elements, nutrients, um, organic matter, conductivity, et cetera, we are able to build a statistical model um, with a team uh, working through uh, those uh, group at Johns Hopkins, University of Maryland, um, at Emory University, Ara Longini, who is now at the University of Washington, so the statistical model allowed us to be able to predict the epidemics based simply on the environmental parameters. And so quite literally, the relationship is the bacterium in the water body, the association with copepods, which are fed upon by shellfish, which in turn are fed upon by humans. And without proper sanitation, person-to-person -person transmission can be highly volatile and obviously occurs to great degree, but it really is the environment that we look to as the source of the bacteria, which carry out functions that are important 
uh, naturally. That is carbon cycling, nitrogen cycling, particularly the carbon of chitin. Uh, otherwise, bays such as the Chesapeake Bay would be paved in crab shells if it were not for the chitin digesting bacteria. But it's in the Bay of Bengal that many of the secrets of the relationship with the environment that we've been able to tease out. And particularly the relationship of sea surface temperature, uh, which allowed us to understand the seasonality, the spring epidemics which occur relentlessly in Bangladesh, and the fall epidemics which occur. The relationship to sea surface height, of course, is also important because it is the intrusion of the salt water into the river systems from which the uh, inhabitants of, of, of Bangladesh take their drinking water directly and obviously lead to the plankton population, spring and fall uh, population blooms. These relationships, we can determine that we probably could measure quite uh, effectively uh, using satellite imagery and relationships. In fact, what we did show very early in our work in the 80s that this relationship was quite uh, striking between sea surface temperature in blue and the cholera epidemics in red. That is, the peaks that occur were quite predictable, based, corrected actually, uh, for the plankton population blooms that occur six weeks um, earlier than shown. That is, when the temperature uh, arises, about six weeks later, the plankton population bloom occurs, and then about two or three weeks later, there's an epidemic of cholera due to the large number of plankton, the large numbers of vibrios on the plankton, and that correlation then is quite dramatic. We've carried this out further using more sophisticated models with Calcutta, Matla, Bangladesh, showing the correlation between um, the observed numbers of cholera cases and those predicted based on our uh, models employing satellite data as well as ground truth. In fact, the relationship is so dramatic that for Calcutta, for a milligram per cubic meter increase in chlorophyll will translate to a 33% increase in the number of cholera cases. And a millimeter per day increase in rainfall will translate to 7% increase in the number of cholera cases in Calcutta. And similar changes or translations for Matla, Bangladesh. So um, let me turn now to molecular genetics because it tells us even more interesting da uh, data about this bacterium and the ocean relationships. In the year 2000, we sequenced the bacterium and showed that it has two chromosomes, a small chromosome and a large chromosome. This was done by John Heidelberg, a former student who was then postdocing at uh, the Institute for Genomic Research, Tiger, in collaboration with uh, John Mechelanos at Harvard and our group at Maryland. We have subsequently, just a year or so ago, sequenced 35 Vibrio strains, 23 strains of cholera from all over the world, and uh, including strains isolated in 2010 um, from, uh, in, and held in culture collections from Saudi Arabia, strains isolated from Madras, from Dhaka, Bangladesh, etc. And this just gives you, I show it simply to show that a wide range chronologically, geographically, clinical, environmental, uh, etc. What we discovered is that there's a mosaic in the genomic structure. Now, that the, across the top is um, the reference strain. Uh, that's simply the first sequence strain. That's the only reason it's called reference. And then the blue means those are genes that are in the reference strain, but not in the subsequent uh, strains that were sequenced. And the list of strains for the large and small chromosomes is shown to the right. So it's a mosaic structure. No one strain is absolutely identical to every other. And when you compare them against other Vibrio species, there are even uh, greater differences. But what we were able to determine is that we could actually follow the evolution of this particular bacterium to the various serotypes and the various pathogenicity characteristics carried by the Vibrio. And we have concluded based on our studies that this bacterium is highly promiscuous in that there's a lot of gene exchange that goes on, particularly one of the most important sets of genes that are exchanged are the genes that, that, that regulate, that control, and, and uh, code for the 
O1 serotype, which is considered to be the epidemic strain, and that in fact what we've been monitoring over the last 100 years with the O1 serotype are actually the genes that code for it, and that the backbone can vary because these genes can be laterally transferred. In fact, we've concluded that the Vibrios are much like influenza in that you have genomic drift and genomic shift amongst these strains that are found widely distributed throughout the world oceans. The evidence for the environment as a genome reservoir is becoming very, very convincing, at least in my view. In fact, in 1986, there was a strain of cholera isolated from a river in Australia, nine years after a cholera outbreak in that region, and 25 years after the onset of the seventh pandemic that we're currently in, uh, in a thousand kilometers from Australia, where would that so late Sulawesi onset of the seventh pandemic began? Now, the studies that we have done have shown that that strain fits very nicely into the genomes of the cholera bacteria that are um, um, part of the seventh pandemic clade, so that that strain has remained in the environment all the time. And so the data from the analysis points to the environment as a source of the seventh pandemic clade, and it demonstrates the environment as the natural ecosystem of pathogenic strains of Vibrio cholerae. And epidemic strains can and do live outside of the human body. Now, a study that we did uh, just completed recently, I had the good fortune of being able to uh, do a dive on the Alvin. And uh, in observing from the windows of the Alvin, what appeared to be plankton copepods swimming about. And I asked my colleague, there are only three of us, the pilot, one of the scientists, and myself, that's all that fits into the Alvin, um, asked whether there were deep sea copepods. And indeed, the answer was yes. So we captured some of the uh, copepods from around that hydrothermal vent and uh, did some analyses um, of the um, bacteria uh, in the laboratory, extracting the DNA from the uh, hydrothermal vent bacteria. This was an, Al an Alvin dive in the East Pacific rise southwest of the Mexican coast, which we were able to get uh, these bacteria isolated. We were able to show that they were related to Vibrio cholera because when we plated them onto the media, we got those yellow colonies. And then subsequent DNA analyses showed that their high relationship to other pathogenic Vibrios like cholera and Vibrio parahemolyticus. The sequence of this deep sea Vibrio then uh, showed that it does have two chromosomes and that uh, in fact there's a um, uh, relationship between the pathogenic Vibrios that are pathogenic for humans found in natural bodies of water around the world, uh, but not necessarily in the deep sea. We tested uh, the uh, bacteria, phenotypic and molecular traits, and the conclusion is that it is a new species, but it does have all of the uh, virulence characteristics, the secretion system, the uh, hemolysins, the various other pathogenicity traits of Vibrio cholera. So the question is, why is this deep sea Vibrio carrying all these quotation uh, marks around pathogenicity traits? Well, it's, it's a bacterium that's decorated, my, my uh, simple term, decorated with a large number of genomic islands that carry these pathogenicity traits, but more to the point, that this Vibrio antiquarius, which we have named, encodes many genes that can be interpreted as contributing to its being native to the deep sea because some of the genes that are found in cholera have been shown by colleagues at Scripps to contribute to barrow tolerance. But in fact, there are many homologs of virulence genes, and we suspect that these genes provide a more fundamental purpose, and that is they're related to the commensal nature of the bacteria with the zooplankton, in that many of the traits that we consider to be pathogenic, pathogenicity genes are, in fact, genes that code for factors that provide 
a survival trait and functional enhancement of the capability of the organism in its natural environment and in association with the animals with which it's found. And so the genome is capable of, of evolving very rapidly according to changing environmental parameters. And the, bar the battery of these virulence genes strongly suggests that the functions in the natural environment are critical to life both in the deep sea but also are ancestral to the bacteria. Now we've done some studies in Iceland and the Vibrio cholerae has been shown to be endemic to that country. Uh, the geothermally active sites with water temperatures above 30 degrees that increase to warm temperatures at low tide and then mix with seawater provide ideal conditions for the naturally occurring cholera bacteria. These are some of the areas where uh, Brad Haley, a student in the laboratory, has isolated the Vibrio cholerae during a uh, Fulbright uh, study in Iceland. Cholera has never been reported in Iceland. Cholera is a reportable disease in Iceland, and the health and the genealogical records are highly detailed in Iceland. There have been other cases of pandemics, plague and influenza, etc., cetera, uh, particularly in these geothermally uh, located regions. But we've been able to isolate Vibrio cholerae, or Brad, I should say, has been able to isolate, the plus means the isolation is positive. And so the question is, uh, what is this bacterium with all these um, virulence factors doing in a country where it has never caused cholera? We have to conclude again that these so-called pathogenicity genes are really survival genes or functional genes for the natural environment. Uh, why is there no cholera? Well, one reason is that drinking water originates as rainwater is filtered through basaltic rock and it's geothermally heated to steam at some point in its cycle, so it's pasteurized. Icelanders do not typically eat shellfish. Mussels are used as fishing bait, not food, and oysters don't grow along the Icelandic coast, so there's not a whole lot of interaction with water. Essentially, I guess there's not great uh, swimming beaches in Iceland. Um, but why do these strains have so many virulence factor? A role in the natural ecology of cholera um, evolutionary roles that are not for human infection, and that blue mussels have a high concentration of sialic acid, and one set of genes allows for sialic acid utilization by the cholera bacteria, and also the uh, capacity to break down chitin. Let me talk about the Hayton cholera epidemic. It's an ongoing effort um, to uh, study, um, we're, we're, we're studying the epidemic. We've gotten about 70 isolates um, from various parts of Haiti. It's an epidemic that ravaged the disaster-struck island of Haiti. First, the earthquake in January, uh, a, a, um, uh, a uh, hurricane uh, in August, and then immediate with tremendous flooding, and then immediately thereafter, the cholera epidemic. Now, the, um, the initial um, uh, results or a press release based on some some uh, rather crude estimates of relationship from the Centers for Disease Control stated that these isolates are identical, uh, meaning they're the same strain and similar to the cholera strain in South Asia. Uh, in a subsequent article um, published, uh, suggested that the sequence was very similar. Well, if you simply take the, the sequence of the, um, the, the cholera vibrios from Haiti and the Asiatic cholera, and by the way, the Asiatic data are those that we published in 2009, without taking into account the laterally transferred genes, you would say, well, indeed, the Bangladesh and the Haitian strains are very similar. However, if you remove the laterally transferred genes and you simply look at the backbone of the strains, we find that um, there are some differences. And so our investigation showing various um, uh, genes, cassettes that can be moved back and forth. If these th and that are related to the uh, Asian and African strains of cholera, we find that in fact the um, Haitian strains separate quite strongly from the um, uh, Asian strains, the Haitian strains. And amongst the, um, 
three or four strains that have been sequenced, uh, even there, there are some differences uh, amongst those uh, strains. So I think that the evidence preliminary suggests possibly that this is more likely an indigenous, indigenous strain that has um, broken out in Haiti. And um, stay tuned because we're in the process now of sequencing another 100 uh, Vibrio cholerae, including about 40 to 50 strains from all over Haiti to get a better understanding of the distribution of the backbone stra uh, uh, genomes in that particular country. Having described all of this work using satellite data model construction for environmental prediction, uh, genomics to understand the distribution globally of the genes and the pathogenicity genes, what was it could we, that we could do for those natives uh, who depend on this kind of water taken directly for their drinking water? The hypothesis was that if, in fact, the bacteria are totally um, predominantly associated with plankton, if we could filter out plankton, we should be able to reduce the cholera epidemics. And here are the uh, villagers collecting filtered water, which we um, concluded from analyses of a variety of very inexpensive material, including seri cloth and used seri cloth, uh, folded three or four times, would give, based on electron microscopy analysis, about a 20 micron mesh filter, uh, and the plankton are about two to 300 uh, microns in size. We showed in the laboratory that we could remove about 100% of the zooplankton by this simple filtration technique, published the paper back in 1996, and then did a study in uh, uh, Bangladesh uh, lining up those that would use sari cloth um, filters and those who would use nylon, very expensive, cost about $10 a yard, but shown to be effective in Africa against dracunculasis, which has an intermediate stage in copepods, and then the controls. This was statistically carefully laid out by Estelle Russick Cohen, who um, now is leading a, a statistical team at the Food and Drug Administration, but worked with us for 20 years in Maryland. By using women as extension agents and educating them as to the reasons why filtration was a good idea and how to do the filtration and having them go out every week for um, three years to the villages uh, where they were filtering to instruct them on filtering. And incidentally, this is a study funded by the Nursing Institute at NIH. We had uh, submitted the proposal to NIAID, but they considered it not too sophisticated and sent it over to the Nursing Institute. Thank you, Nursing Institute. Um, in any case, we were able to um, instruct the village women through the extension agents, and um, it was not difficult to explain to them that without the plankton, which you could see swimming about in the water that was filtered, it was a lot better for their children. Um, we were able to reduce uh, cholera by about 50%. Uh, and of those cases that occurred with the SARI filtration, we were able to track every one of them to either visiting families in other villages where they didn't filter or a breach in the filtration that is not filtering because they get, didn't feel like doing it that day or whatever. So we were able to track down all of the cases that occurred, published this in PNAS um, uh, in 2003. We went back five years later, thanks to the Thrasher Foundation, to see if this was all sustainable. And we found that the, those using sari cloth, 75% of the families, five years later, were still filtering. Um, the, other, the other phenomenon was that we found that 50%, more than 50% of the control villages were now filtering. So it became very, very difficult to determine the efficacy, except we knew the overall rate was down. Um, so, um, what we also discovered was, besides the sari cloth filtration being sustainable and continuing to protect the villages from cholera in Bangladesh, we, we were also able to show that there is a herd effect, namely that if you were surrounded by families who filtered, but you didn't filter or your family didn't, 
you were still protected, and that was the person-to-person -person transmission not kicking in. Now, I would say that going back to Robert Koch, he himself, back in 1884, said, I am not a supporter of the exclusive drinking water theory. I think the ways in which cholera can spread in a place are very diverse, and almost every place has its own peculiar conditions, which must be thoroughly searched out, the measures of which are of use to protect that particular place from the pestilence that correspond to these conditions. Well, what he didn't know was that we are now finding evidence that the cholera epidemics are local. In other words, in the ponds in Bangladesh, that the strains that we isolate and that cause epidemics within those villages are strains that we can determine genetically derive from the ponds and that they are highly local. And I'll close by pointing out this is an area of the world in relation to, to all the other climate talks we've been hearing today that is very heavily populated. This is a population density in 1730, 1750, 1760, 1790, 1800, 1810, 1820, 1840, 1870, 1890, 1900, 1920, 1930, 1940, 1950, 1970, 1980, 1990, 2000, and even more if I had the data, which I wasn't able to get um, uh, for the last 10 years. And this is where water reuse is extremely high, but more to the point, it's where the sea level rise is going to affect those populations. And um, the red is where zero to one meter rise already occurs with flooding. And the two meter rise, the slightly orange areas. Uh, the gray area is a five meter rise. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. These are going to be the refugees. And there was a question raised earlier this morning, where do they go? Political boundaries, good question. Very likely, they will be moving to Western Europe and to the United States. This is um, India uh, just a few years ago in the recent flooding. And this is what these populations already have to deal with post-monsoon. In the words of John Muir, a very, very poignant. When one tugs at a single thing in nature, he, and I would add she, finds it hitched to the rest of the universe. My many collaborators, for which I am most grateful, in Bangladesh, students at the University of Maryland, collaborators from around the world, and collaborators from other countries. Thank you. Is there a relationship between the human blood types and resistance to cholera? Yes, amazing study um, showed that during the epidemic in um, Latin America, I think it was the old blood type is more susceptible. And so we don't know why, but there is some relationship to blood type and susceptibility. What is the relationship of uh, cholera to its bacteriophages? This fellow at Harvard Vicolinus showed that when the bacteriophages were very high, the cholera was very low, and so therefore these uh, viruses are, imp uh, are def have a, an effect on the... Uh, yes, there are viruses that attack bacteria, um, <clears throat> and these uh, bacteriophages, as they're referred to, uh, in the Dhaka city area, where essentially there's a lot of sewage in the system, that seems to be very interesting that post-epidemic, um, the numbers of vajas go way up. But we have not found that to be the case in the, in the remote village regions where we work uh, in uh, Bakuganj and uh, in Mathbaria, down right near in the mangrove areas near the uh, Bay of Bengal. So this seems to be a phenomenon that probably is effective, but in the heavily um, sewage-contaminated waters uh, in Dhaka. Uh, 
And in the lateral transfer, are these bacteriophages involved? The bacteriophages are involved, and that was the work of Michelanos and his, his student. Uh, a very important discovery that uh, it is one of the mechanisms, but an important one in the cholera toxin coding genes being transferred from bacterium to bacterium. Um, it seems to have a flagella. Is it motile? Yes, the bacterium is motile. It has a single polar flagellum, uh, but uh, it also forms biofilms. And in the biofilms, there's some evidence that it loses the flagellum, but then it regrows it when it goes into the planktonic stage. Yeah, I'm involved uh, with creating another new mi micromotility meter that uses submarine warfare to detect swimming organisms. Worked pretty well on schistosomes back in 1984. But I'm thinking that may be a bigger field. It's a lot easier than staining them and running them through a, a flow cytometer. Uh, well, there's an interesting work that we've been thinking about collaborating with a team in Singapore where they have been able to use um, a sonic um, um, uh, mechanisms for being able to concentrate particulates into the water so that it can be entrained. And we think that we probably could use this as a way to detect the presence of pathogenic bacteria using DNA um, sequencing, uh, having entrained the particulates and the, the uh, planktonic material and being able to detect exactly what's in the body of water. I was really interested in your presentation and the way you structured the presentation. Um, I thought it, your research obviously does just a, a really wonderful, beautiful job of integrating all these different aspects, these different dimensions, everything from the genome to sort of cultural dynamics. Um, and I, I was interested in the fact that you came to climate change at the very end of your talk. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your thinking in, in terms of how does climate change fit in with health research? Um, how do we structure, because there's so much interest in, um, I'm a social scientist, and there's a lot of interest in the social sciences in, you know, funding climate change research. Um, but one of the challenges, I think, is that you're dealing with these very complex systems, and climate change is often sort of yet another level that's exacerbating something that's already going on in the system. Um, so could you just talk a little bit in terms of your own experience working with climate change? What role um, should climate change play in, in designing and thinking about health studies? Um, how should we fund it? How should we structure it? Um, should we be thinking in terms of climate change, or should we really be focusing on sort of the issues that we already know are there um, that are just being exacerbated by climate change? Um, and there's three or four questions in your comments and question. Uh, first of all, um, uh, cholera is a good example. Uh, there are many others, malaria, uh, various... Um, encephalitis um, uh, diseases transmitted by viruses, those that have a vector. I, I like to think of cholera as a vector-borne disease, the vector being the plankton, but of course this is another idea like many of mine that have been resisted and ended up in textbooks, so maybe 10 years from now it'll be in the textbooks. Um, but um, I think that um, it's an example of where uh, satellite uh, monitoring can be very, very important for health prediction and for uh, uh, cases like the instance of cholera, if you have a, an early warning system, that allows them to be much more effective in your public health response because then you can encircle uh, the outbreak and you can, you can control it. Um, I would not want to say that we're going to have more cholera. I think what will happen is that we will have longer cholera seasons because we'll have warmer temperatures for longer periods of time. And we also know that um, there's a relationship with rainfall. We've shown this. I didn't, wasn't able to give them many, many other sets of data for Africa um, and for South America. But we know that there's a relationship to rainfall. So where you have these severe rainfalls and a breakdown in public health uh, capacity, then you may have sharper epidemics and more frequent epidemics. But, but I think that in the developed countries, we do have a powerful, at least for the moment, a powerful public health structure, and that that can be mobilized. And then if we have the predictive capacity that the climate change leading us to understanding these relationships of the environment and these diseases that derive from the environment, and increasingly we find many human diseases deriving 
from environmental vectors and environmental sources, we will be better able to predict and cont contain, control outbreaks of infectious disease. And then finally, I want to point out that, uh, that two people who were really critical in the studies in, in, in Bangladesh were a social scientist who understood the culture and who was able to assist us in being able to reach out to the village women and uh, taught us how we should bring that in and the statistician who really helped us design the field trial so that we would get statistically significant results. So I think the interdisciplinary approach is really what is very necessary. And I think the social and behavioral sciences must be much more interwoven into the climate studies. Hope that answers your question. Historically, which country or which region is known to have the oldest occurrence of cholera? Which countries are? Or region, the oldest occurrence of cholera, historically speaking. Oh, the oldest, earliest, the yeah, earliest yeah, countries? Right. Oh, I think there's a wonderful <laughs> book by Christopher Hamlin. It's called Biography, uh, Cholera, a Biography, and it was published a year ago. And he, he is not a microbiologist, he's not a medical scientist, he's a historian. But he's interested in the history of, of medicine and he takes an objective view and points out that cholera has been global, but we have pinpointed Bangladesh and India as the source or the home, but that's only because in the last 100 years or 200 years, we have eliminated cholera from Western Europe and from uh, the developed countries, United States, et cetera, where we have introduced safe drinking water, flocculated, filtered, chlorinated, safely distributed. And so that allows me to make a comment as well that I think that we must use the mechanism of safe drinking water because we eliminate, and I didn't have time to go into it, many other diseases that you can control by filtration, but we should be thinking of empowering the individual, empowering the family and the community who can provide safe drinking water simply and effectively and not think of transporting highly complex structures of central water purification and distribution. It isn't going to happen, at least not in my lifetime. I think I have some fans in the audience, thank you. <laughs> so I, I think empowerment is important for the individual. Yeah, yeah. Ter terribly basic question. How long does it take a cholera fibrio to die in cooking? How long does it take a cholera victim to die? Yes. It's very much dose dependent. If you have it in the Oh, water. to kill the bacterium. Yes. Oh, the simple thing is boil the water. That's it. Just boil um, and the problem is in Bangladesh, there is a paucity of fuel wood. The women, part of their job is to collect the cow dung and the goat dung and dry it in the sun and that's the fuel used to cook food to heat uh, water, etc. So there's a paucity of um, fuel wood and that's why the simple solution which was used in Latin America of boil water alerts, and again, that's another warning that can be provided if you have the capacity to predict when the epidemics will occur, okay. and so you can get rid of the bacterium. Okay. 